Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk about this market continuing to attempt to push higher. The S&P getting above 4,200 earlier in the day, only to close back below this level. What does this mean that our major indexes are trying to accelerate to the upside but failing? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of Stock Charts. Our Stock Charts platform is designed to help you understand these markets by focusing on the messages of price and trend and momentum. All the tools we talk about on the show, including breadth and sentiment indicators to help sort of quantify investor psychology and focus on actionable ideas. We continue to have this really fascinating market environment where a small number of stocks are doing incredibly well and continue to press those moves to the upside. The Nasdaq Composite having a decent day going higher and making a new high for the year yet again. However, the average S&P stock not having a decent year necessarily and per certainly not having a great year as uh, a small number of stocks are certainly doing. What does that mean? How can we break down that relationship? And what does that tell us when there's that narrow leadership and, uh, and lack of support underneath the hood? Well, the market keeps going higher. It doesn't matter what we think about it. The averages keep accelerating to the upside, but we have to, uh, to question the sustainability of those moves. Let's look at our market recap today. Focus on what happened through the course of the today. Communication services having another decent update and staples struggling. A lot of individual names will break down as well. Let's start looking at the major averages. The S&P 500 literally uh, ending the day flat. Now, this is after pushing to the upside. One of my three and three charts, because I was getting them set up just a little bit ago, was looking at the new Dow theory, looking at the S&P and the Nasdaq Composite, recognizing that the S&P was getting above 4,200. Finally, I'm all ready to make this big noisy announcement about it. We failed to close above there. We failed back below 4,200. So I feel like from the jaws of victory, this market keeps snatching a defeat. And it's interesting to see how far the market can go, driven by, again, a relatively small number of stocks. And Nasdaq Composite having a decent update, up half a percent. Nasdaq 100 up about a third of a percent. The Dow down by about the same amount as the Nasdaq was up, down about 0.4 percent. Mid caps and small caps both having a decent day of it. And if you think about when financials are doing OK, when REITs are doing OK, um, financials in particular, these are that's a sector that is, is weighed a little more heavily in mid and small caps, certainly with all the regional banks and others, uh, much smaller weight in the S&P 500. So you're seeing a nice update for small caps up about three quarters of a percent. The uh, mega cap S&P 100 flat for the day, just like the S&P. The VIX pushing higher as well. And I think that's, you know, when you think about all the different uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, pieces of information we can use to validate or invalidate what we're seeing from the major averages and their ongoing attempt to make new highs for the year. Breadth and sentiment are top of mind for sure. We'll look at some of the breadth indicators here later in the uh, in the market recap. In terms of sentiment, the VIX is one of my favorite uh, measures of sentiment. It's remaining fairly low, bouncing up today uh, another 0.4 up to 1720. Interest rates overall moving higher. There's an article I read earlier on Bloomberg talking about uh, you know, speculation that rates were going to continue go, to go much higher from here. Certainly some uh, buzz from some of the Fed governors today about uh, you know, rate hikes needing to happen. Maybe multiple rate hikes is one of the Fed governors I'm mentioning earlier today. So just we cannot get any closure on this thing uh, about what the, what the Fed may be doing. We're just going to have to wait for subsequent meetings. The June meeting, of course, coming up here in a couple weeks. Uh, and, uh, and at this point, the market pricing in that we're done, uh, pricing in much more likely that uh, the, the Fed is done as opposed to additional rate hikes. But that is very, very fluid. And just from day to day, we're seeing the Fed funds futures price in very different scenarios. So I think that's still very much an open question. Today, the yield curve overall all moving to the upside, right, from the five-year yield up to around three. 
3.77. Long bond yields almost to 4% again. Uh, so we're continuing to see sort of this push higher in rates as bond prices are coming down. The TLT down another third percent. Uh, we'll look at that chart a little later if we have time for it. Uh, just the fact that the TLT, the ag, are getting down to the lower half of their range that they've been in year to date. Dollar index, not much of a change. So you don't really have that scenario where sort of the dollar strength has killed risk assets. That's happened previously in, uh, in other market regimes. We're not necessarily seeing that today. Gold and silver both moving lower, although the rest of the commodity space sort of mixed. You have some soft commodities like corn uh, having a decent update overall, but kind of mixed results uh, for the most part. Those precious metals and the base metals all uh, in the red today. Copper price is down about 1.2%. Finally, cryptocurrencies, for the most part, I see this as pretty positive, although, again, they didn't have a great weekend. Um, a lot of times, you come back on money, you see some significant moves in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Not necessarily the case uh, this time. Sort of a noisy period, but, uh, but no dramatic moves. Bitcoin currently just below 27,000. Ether hanging on just above 1,800. And both of those are up about a half a percent uh, from Sunday's uh, end of day trading. In terms of sector movements, as I mentioned in the introduction, communication services, number one, up 0.9 percent. Our top ranked stock in our uh, stock chart scooter rankings, the large cap rankings, is Meta, certainly one of the biggest uh, names, top five name in the uh, in the U.S., uh, and, and strength in the metas of the world are certainly pushing the XLC uh, to impressive uh, an impressive year, up 0.9% again today. Real estate, number two, followed by financials. Everything else kind of flat to down. The worst performing sectors today, consumer staples down 1.5%. And just like charts like Meta and Alphabet and HubSpot, some of the ones we'll look at if we have time here, uh, as strong as they look, look for weakness in areas like consumer staples, right? The XLP hitting resistance, Coke, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, those kind of names all kind of rolling over after attempting to make a new high for the year. So certainly, again, there are plenty of stocks that are working and certainly, honestly, way more stocks that are not working or certainly way more that are not as significantly strong as those mega cap names. Let's look at the S&P 500 chart to see what happened today. I, I made the line a little bit thinner just so we can focus on the fact that we keep trading above 4,200 but closing back below it. And that's pretty classic behavior, to be honest with you, when you face a significant resistance level. Um, you are not the only one if you're keying in on those February highs, which we certainly have been. If you're recognizing the importance of the 4,200 level, which we definitely would agree with, we're not the only ones on this planet with skin in the game that are looking at that level and expecting resistance. So I'm not surprised that that's pretty much exactly where we closed on Thursday of last week. Friday, we traded above, even opened above, but closed back below 4,200. Today, same thing. We traded above there, but the close wasn't holding that level. So again, as we've mentioned many times, a bullish phase trades not just to resistance, but through resistance. And we did not get that sort of validation from the S&P. The RSI for the S&P 500 remaining right around 60, which again, is sort of the upper boundary when we're in a bearish phase or in a neutral phase. So you'd wanna see the S&P get above 4,200 on improving momentum. That would be sort of the bullish outcome out of this scenario. Now, if we look at the exact same chart, but look at like the QQQ, you can see how that improves, right? We face resistance, again, a little different look, but look at how we powered higher over the last couple of weeks. The RSI pushing well above 60 now into the overbought uh, range. Now that can often mean a short-term pullback, which is certainly possible, but overall it shows the strength that uh, we've seen from some of the tech and communication areas of the market that we've not seen in other parts of the S&P 500. You know, briefly, a couple charts I wanted to just finish up on as we uh, wrap up our market recap. I wanted to look at the bullish percent indexes. We look at the S&P 500's bullish percent index. You know, it's around 53, 54%. Um, those aren't horrible numbers, right? We're over half, which means over half of the S&P members are in a bullish point and figure chart. That's not bad, but they're not raging bull market signals, right? And if you look back over the last 12 months, when this indicator has gone above 70%, that usually indicates we're at the latter stages of a rally. Maybe worth noting, we haven't gotten that sort of signal yet, but look at the next chart here. This is the NASDAQ 100's bullish percent index. We shared this chart a number of times 
over the last 12 months because when we get above uh, that um, 70% level, level, meaning over 70% of the NASDAQ 100 stocks are in a bullish point and figure chart, that usually tells us we're in the later stages. These red shaded areas indicate when the indicator was above 70% then went back below. Look at what has happened soon after pretty much every one of those signals going back over the last 12 months. It's been a pretty decent pullback. Now, there hasn't been end of the world pullbacks like in February and March, but they've certainly certainly come back uh, for at least two to two to three weeks, if not, you know, three months or so. Right. Some of the longer uh, retracements have come after that indication. The reason why I'm bringing up this chart now is we're really close to getting above that 70 percent level. We're a big day away from doing that. And all that does in my opinion, is is basically initiate this signal that has basically uh, been very accurate at identifying the end of that bull market phase or the end of that cyclical rally. So that might be something to watch here through the course of this week. You know, in terms of the strength, it's areas of the market we've talked about, Alphabet, right, uh, with an RSI almost to 80, making another uh, high for the year here uh, today. Within technology, you have charts like HubSpot. And these are good charts. And again, I, I have no problem with these charts. When, I, when, I, when you get the skepticism of further upside, I will maintain that no matter what you think about the broader market environment, it's always a good time to own good charts. So good charts in good trends that are not ending, I don't have a problem with holding on to them. What you need to be careful of is making sure that you have a good exit strategy, right? So when this chart is looking so good, if you have a position in HubSpot, now's the time to be thinking about what would you need to see? What would need to happen on this chart for you to want to unwind at least, at least part of that position? Is it a chandelier exit, like Dr. Alexander Elder would uh, probably suggest? Is it a percent retracement off of the highs? Is it breaking the 50-day moving average or something like that? Have a plan for how you would maybe unwind a very strong position in case things really start to roll over from here. Maybe Tesla might be another one to look at. One of the better performing names today in the S&P 500, but I think still a lot to prove, right? I, I mean, just getting above a trend line over the last uh, you know, couple months is, is still an open question. Getting above the 200, getting above $200 a share, these will all be things that I think would create a very different look at what do we call a change of character. Right now, this looks a lot like a bullish uh, flag pattern, which is where you have a rally, then you sort of have this parallel decline of lower highs and lower lows. You need to get above that upper boundary if you want to get uh, excited from here. Last chart, and then we have to wrap it up. I'm seeing plenty of things roll over. I mentioned Staples, Coke, uh, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble are all examples of that. With And uh, consumer discretionary, Nike is a good example, right? Closing below its 200-day moving average for the first time since December, undercutting the lows from March, right? The more that stocks are unable to make new highs and, and then undercutting their lows, that's a dangerous market environment. But again, the strength in certain names allowing our benchmarks to stay strong in the face of some weaker charts like Nike. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering some of your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate putting this show on for you every day. We have a great team here at StockCharts TV helping us do so. A lot of great plans for the studio space and for this show in the coming weeks and months. So stay tuned as we build out this show and uh, bring on more great guests and perspectives for you. A couple quick announcements before we answer some questions from the mailbag. First off, our mailbag is fueled from people like you sending in your questions to us. Email's the best way. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the way to get a hold of us. We're also on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we have our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our channel there, and we'd love to hear from you and hope and answer your question on our next mailbag at the end of this week. Upcoming schedule, we've had some really fantastic guests recently. This last week was a lot of fun uh, with Jeff Hirsch and Jesse Felder and so many great perspectives. This week, some strong guests. Doug Bush of Chart Smarter. We're going to be talking about the energy sector most likely tomorrow. On Wednesday, the 24th, Andrew Thrasher, founder of Thrasher Analytics. On Thursday, the 25th, John Kosar, a very popular guest from Asbury Research in Chicago. Our latest episode of The Pitch is coming up next Thursday, the 25th as well. Dave Landry, Mark Newton, Joe Rabel will all be on hand. I will be talking to them remotely uh, from here in our studio. We'll get five stock and ETF ideas from each of them, discuss and debate as a group. It should be a lot of fun. I'd encourage you to tune in for that one on uh, Thursday of next week. 
Our next webcast for market misbehavior will be coming up tomorrow on the 23rd at 1 o'clock Eastern called Sell in May Trends versus Cycles. I had a lot of fun talking with Jeff Hirsch uh, on the show uh, last week, also before and after a little bit, just uh, getting his thinking about the whole sell in May and go away phenomenon. He's a m bigger fan of talking about it as the weakest six months or the uh, the, the wrong six months uh, and, uh, and basically talking about risk on versus risk off. We're going to be talking about the historical seasonal cycles and also the current trend and discuss and debate as a group, decide together whether we should sell in May. Go to marketmisbehavior.com slash sell in May to sign up for that free event coming up tomorrow. Let's bring open the final bar mailbag. Thanks so much again for all of your questions. And here is question number one. Dave, how do you think about trading individual stocks in the face of general market weakness? This is a question we received a little bit ago, but I wanted to bring it back up because I guess you could pivot it and say, how do you think about trading individual stocks in the face of general market strength or even general market conditions? You know, we talk often on the show, uh, certainly at least once a week about our um, mindful, nope, about our market trend model. Here it is, uh, looking at the market on three different time frames, And this is something I, I look at every week uh, with my uh, premium members of market misbehavior, because I, for me, thinking about the trend on different time frames that are important to me as an investor is really is really valuable. The medium term time frame for me is my main risk on versus risk off measure, and then I'm going a little longer to understand how my time frame fits into the bigger, more secular trends, and also the shorter term fluctuations that tend to create the waves and patterns that I'm seeing on the medium term time frame. I'd encourage you to have something like this that you are following, uh, because for me it's been essential. It's been a valuable way of recognizing changes in character. But having said that, what, you know, the way that I think of this sort of model is not a, you know, an end-all and be-all model. I would never manage money just on this model alone. For me, it's something that runs in the background. It's an input into my process as opposed to an output from my process. And what I mean is I like understanding the trends on these timeframes and using that as a set of data points that inform my ability to identify opportunities. And I would say, you know, whether or not you think the market as a whole is going to go up or down, I'm a fan of having charts like HubSpot in a portfolio that you're holding because it's a good chart. And what history has taught me of living through a lot of cyclical and secular bear markets in the last 23 years, and, I'm, and hopefully I will continue to do this for many more moons and I'll experience more of both, I will tell you that in any environment, there are always stocks and ETFs somewhere that are working just fine, especially when you look outside the U.S., look at global ETFs, you will find things that completely look different than the main thing that you are considering. If you're trying to analyze the S&P 500, there are plenty of things that look very different from that. And that's just not a unique part of the current environment. That's always the case. So what I would encourage you to do is, number one, have a good model or a good trend following discipline that helps you understand what the trends are. I think that's valuable. Have a good way of identifying ideas in any environment. And, and my main encouragement to you, or what I would suggest, is get very comfortable with the scan engine and the alert system on a platform like Stock Charts. The scanning engine helps you identify ideas. No matter what the market is doing, let me find stocks that are making new three month highs or where the PPO or MACD indicator is giving a buy signal. Stocks that are oversold but just came out of that oversold region, there are arguably plenty of good times to buy that despite or you know, regardless of the overall market conditions. Alerts are basically a way to automate that process. All right, tell me anytime any of the stocks in this or ETFs in this list have a certain criteria that's sort of my buy conditions. Spend some time with those parts of our platform. You're going to help stock charts help you make better decisions and identify better opportunities regardless of the market environment. Really thoughtful question, and, and thanks for uh, sending that one in. Next question, are Alphabet, Google, uh, Microsoft, and Meta advancing because of better access to capital? Now, I, I don't like to get too much into the fundamental story, so I'll keep this a little more on the macro market structure type of uh, discipline. Uh, but you asked about some of these names, and to be honest with you, some of the charts like Microsoft and Alphabet and Meta stand out to me because they're so much stronger than the S&P 500. The S&P is testing it's February high, but there are plenty of stocks that have blown right through their February highs and gone much further. And these are the names that we've talked about, right? Sort of these mega cap fang and fang like stocks that are just kind of working much better than the average stock, right? And just look at the gap between these names and an equal weighted S&P to see how big of a uh, uh, differentiation that we've experienced in 2023. 
So, you know, what is the reason for this? So, I mean, there are a number of things we could we could discuss and debate. I mean, a couple of things that come to mind. Number one, you would ask particularly about access to capital. I think it's it's a little less access to external capital, but more having capital readily available, right? A company like Microsoft or Alphabet uh, or Meta are known for having a ton of cash. Microsoft for decades, right, has been the example of way more cash than you thought a company would ever have on hand. They just have had it available forever, right? So if they need to fund some new thing, if they want to go all in on AI or whatever it is that they would want to do, cloud uh, cloud storage or whatever, they have the ability to do it and they don't need anyone else to help them do so. Emerging technology companies are very reliant on VC funding, on external services. Sources of capital, those have certainly dried up in a big way relative to previous parts in this cycle. So I think that is certainly impacting uh, certainly the emerging growth names more than you would with some of those larger names. Second thing would be uh, artificial intelligence, right? I'm thinking of conversations with John Markman, uh, who wrote some really fantastic uh, books and reports about long term thematic plays like AI, automation, nanotechnology electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is what companies can you know, survive and thrive and what companies are really gonna benefit from those emerging themes. And if you're looking at stocks that have had a good reaction with the explosion of attention to AI, it's those mega cap names. And I think in, uh, the, the third thing I would mention would just be kind of a consolidation of power. We're seeing again, a narrowing of focus on a small number of big conglomerate names that control a lot of the opportunities. Think recently about Apple with their um, uh, payment processing, right? And, and um, uh, uh, you know, payment, uh, um, what is it, like payment plans, right? Uh, there are companies like Affirm, AFRM, which that is their business. PayPal, trying to allow you to, uh, you know, defer your payments. Apple goes ahead and does it and embeds it on their iPhone. A lot of their business all of a sudden evaporates like that. And that's the advantage of those larger names. Now, the downside of these names is the, are the regulatory risk, right? And, and, and someone in some position of power decides that that's too much power and you have antitrust sort of discussion and legislation. That's the risk to this trade right now, I would say, among many. But great point about access to capital. I think that's, uh, that's true. And those other two examples that I, uh, that I listed out, I think, are part of that story as well. Let's get to the next question. Dave, is there an indicator for percent of stocks whose 200-day moving average is turning upwards? So I will say a twofold answer to that. Uh, no is the first answer. That's an easy no answer, um, unfortunately, um, for all of us that we don't have that readily available. But the good news is, and I want to thank you for that, because I will tell you the more questions like this that we get about a particular feature that we don't have, the higher we will prioritize that. So if something like this, do me a favor, if this is something you're passionate about, send a note into our support desk because we literally track the number of requests we get from our users as a way to help prioritize some of those uh, things. So if there's a data set we don't have, if there's a tool you feel like we don't have that we need, if there's something you're using on another platform and it would be awesomer if we had it on stock charts, send a note to our support desk and that will help us to prioritize it higher. So we don't have that as a breadth indicator, like percent of stocks above a 50-day or 200-day moving average. I'm putting it on a list and hopefully I'll be able to add it for you uh, here at some point. But I do want to tell you, you can use the scanning engine to find that. And I would say there's a, there's a um, something called, here we go, stocks over a rising 200 day moving average. This is a scan that I created a long time ago and I randomly run it because I was looking for stocks in a particular group. So in this case, S&P 500 members that were above an upward sloping 200 day moving average. Here's how I did it, two arguments, right? The rest of these are all just making the universe a certain type of stock. The real key are line five and line seven, uh, line six. Line five says basically the difference between the current price and the 200 day simple moving average and it's greater than zero, meaning we are above the 200 day moving average. That's what that line means in particular. This next line down basically says over the last two days, the 200-day um, the moving average has gone up. So today's is higher than yesterday's, and yesterday's is higher than the, the one two days ago. A lot of time with the scanning engine like this, it's incredibly powerful and incredibly flexible. You just have to understand how to add some of those arguments. The good news is we have a bunch of resources. Look at our chart school, look at some of the blog articles where we have things like this listed out. If you're looking for this particular thing, just hit pause wherever you're reading it, copy this down, put it in the scanning engine directly as it is here, and it will look for stocks that are uh, 
having a 200 day sloping, sloping up or down. You could run this scan. You could run a scheduled, scheduled scan on this every day and create your own very own data series so you can track that number and see what percent have that particular criteria in whatever universe you select. That's what I would suggest for now. At some point, hopefully I'll be able to tell you, hey, we got it and here's how you access it as a breadth indicator. Final question. Dave, when should one use log scale versus arithmetic scale charts? Also, did you write the theme music? And I love that so much, as it's probably come up a couple times. I am a musician. Unfortunately, my roles as chief market strategist and dad usually supersede my musician role. However, I am a composer and arranger, and I would love to do that at some point. So on my list, but I haven't done it yet. But what I do want to show you is how to think about these different scales. Let's look at a chart like Apple. All of my charts, pretty much 100% of the time, use arithmetic, sorry, use log scale, logarithmic sale. And it's technically called a semi log scale because the x axis measuring time is not on a log scale. That is actually just on a linear scale because that makes sense. The vertical axis, the y axis, is a logarithmic scale. So that's why we call it a semi-log chart, uh, but that's a little too technical probably than we need. So log scale basically means where you're scaling this, the vertical axis has equal distance for percentage moves, not on absolute movements. To change that, what you do is below here, you wanna click on log scale. If you turn it off, here's the same chart on an arithmetic scale. It doesn't look too different, to be honest with you. If you're looking at those two charts, probably not super noticeable, but look at what happened when we add like 10 years on here. This is the chart of Apple on a, an arithmetic scale going back to the last 10 years. And the problem is, the further you go back, the stock was trading so much lower that all of a sudden the most recent moves are exaggerated. The long time ago moves, which were big percentage moves, are, are kind of muted. Log scale basically addresses that by doing a consistent percent move over time. So a stock that has actually had a consistent 5% growth rate over the last 10 years will look kind of like a hockey stick on an arithmetic scale, but will look more like a log scale, like a, a, a nice consistent trend here. You really, the longer term you look, you wanna use log scale. And the answer is to your question, I would say 90 plus percent of the time, you should be using log scale charts. The only time arithmetic scale charts are okay is a very short time frame or like an intraday chart where you're not really having those sorts of movements that you need to worry about. But anything over a couple months, boy, you better be using log scale and don't, don't make the mistake of not doing that. Make sure that is checked off in, in uh, sharp charts or ACP. We have to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. I mentioned the new Dow theory. We talked about this last week. And again, I, just, I have a laser eye on this chart because I'm eyeing to see now that the Nasdaq Composite has powered above its resistance level from February, do we get that same echo? Do we get that confirmation of the S&P doing so? I'm still not ready to declare this a victory for the bulls, but boy, we're really, really close. On an intraday basis, I would say we need to get above 4,200. On a closing basis, we're technically kind of right there, but we need to see that follow through. We need to see just a little more push higher. And I would love to see that happen, certainly. That would be a strong argument for the bull case, but not quite there. I think this breaking out and then improvement in breadth, that is the bull case from here. If those two things don't happen, I just don't see strong upside potential beyond what we've seen so far. Another way to illustrate this, this is that same closing price on the S&P 500. This is the advanced decline line on the S&P 500. Again, not making a new swing high or threatening to do so just yet. This is the equal weighted S&P, which is nowhere near its February high. As a matter of fact, it's not too far off of its March low. We've talked about narrow leadership. But this is one thing. I actually ran the numbers just before the show today. The weight in the top 10 S&P stocks, Meta, Apple, Amazon, um, Alphabet, those top 10 names are the same weight as the bottom 400 stocks in the S&P 500. So if you're listening to what I'm saying about narrow leadership and saying, yeah, but how big of a deal is it that it's just a small number of stocks? It's actually a huge deal, right? One meta has a big update. It can outweigh 40 stocks basically in the S&P 500 that are having a bad day. That's how big of an impact they're having on our benchmarks right now. Finally, the TLT. This is a bond ETF. We could look at the AG or some of the other um, uh, bond price ETFs. So sort of like the interest rate uh, chart flipped upside down. 
Things I wanted to note here, we've been coming off of the highs from March and April, rotating back toward the lows, which we uh, tested back here in March and again in January. It's right around $98 for the TLT. The RSI is dipping just below 40 as we start this week. Bonds are very, very close to what I'd call a change of character, looking very negative very quickly. RSI getting below 40, the uh, price getting below 98, 98.50 or so could complete a big negative rotation. What does that mean? That would suggest rates certainly going from higher from here, not a great scenario for growth stocks. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks for joining us on a Monday for the final bar. All of our previous interviews are at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow.